All right. Hello and welcome everyone to another webinar series from Amsterdam Data Science. Uh, this week we are partnering with um, the Hogeschool van Amsterdam's Expertise Centrum for Applied Artificial Intelligence to bring you a two-part webinar series where we explore everything applied AI. And this, week, this week's topic focuses on applied AI in retail. To quickly introduce myself and um, Amsterdam Data Science, um, I am Anita and I work at ADS and um, Amsterdam Data Science is a network organization that seeks to promote and foster the data science and AI ecosystem here in Amsterdam. We do this by connecting industry, academia and society and some of the activities that we're involved with are webinars such as these um, to provide people with more knowledge and insight in the field of data science um, and AI. So before I start introducing um, the presenters, um, I would like to quickly poll the audience. We do this so that we have a bit of an idea of um, who our um, viewers are that watch these webinars and so that we can also kind of tailor it to our audience. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And in the meantime, I will introduce um, our first speaker before we start. Um, so today we are joined by two speakers. Um, we have um, T-Bird from the Expertise Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence. And we have Marloes from Bol.com, um, who is our first speaker of the day. Um, Marloes is a data science from the Netherlands. She has a background in computational linguistics and NL NLP. She's been at Bol.com for two years and is currently working on implementing data science solutions in the platform quality department. The title of her presentation is How We Introduce Data Science into a New Space Within Bol.com. At Bol.com, data science has been successfully embedded into various different product teams. Yet, in order to keep innovating, they also explore data science opportunities in new or previously un, um, unexpected or unexplored departments. Last September, Bol.com started a new data science task force within the platform quality department. In this talk, she'll explore what it's like to start a data science team in a new domain and how you can optimize this process much like a machine. And before I'll give the floor to Marloes, um, I'll just like to let you all know that um, there will be a Q&A um, session right after um, both of our speakers talk. So please make use of the Q&A functionality um, at the bottom um, of your screen, and then we'll have those answered for you. Thank you. i will now like to give the floor to Marloes. Thank you, Anita. I'll uh, quickly share my screen. All right. Uh, yeah, let's start. Let's dive in. Um, first of all, uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, thanks for spending your lunch break with us here. Uh, today I'll be talking about how we introduced uh, data science into a new department within Boulder.com. Uh, I'll talk about how we prioritize and tackle problems uh, within this new domain and how you can use our approach to help you uh, prioritize your problems as well. Uh, so first a bit about me. So I'm a, a data scientist at Boulder.com, have been for a little over two years now. Uh, I used to work in the assortment department, but I moved to the platform quality department as the first data scientist there in September. Um, in the platform quality department, we work on creating scalable solutions for detecting unwanted products. Um, so think about things that are um, legally unwanted or ethically unwanted uh, or things that we have policies against. Um, yeah, I have a background in computational linguistics and NLP. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, learning languages and finding out all about the linguistics quirks of this world. Um, so let's dive into um, our uh, situation. So we landed into the platform quality space in September, and this department actually was also founded in September, so it was completely new. It was a merger between a few previously existing teams. Um, so not only was it a newly formed department, there were, was also never any data science in any of the previously existing teams before. Um, so yeah, when you go boldly where no data scientist has gone before, uh, you uh, actually really run into uh, a lot of high expectations and hype. Um, this hype comes from the fact that everybody knows a little bit about data science, but um, sometimes uh, this can lead to thinking, people thinking that they know what data science can do, even though uh, it may or may not be actually possible. So we had a big challenge ahead of us. 
Um, so um, we quickly discovered that there was a whole ecosystem of tools, processes, and people in place that we were not yet familiar with. Uh, we kind of started out as a tiny blip in this existing constellation of these tools and processes and people. And it was our task to get familiar with them as soon as possible so we could uh, get to uh, the meat of the problems, uh, the drawbacks, and, um, and, and discover where we could make the biggest impact. So once you have that domain knowledge, um, it's actually time to uh, investigate how data science can help solve these problems. Um, but as you uh, start in a new domain, uh, a completely new domain, uh, this domain often has many problems to solve, many processes to optimize or automate, uh, and many people um, who believe they have the best ideas uh, or the best problems to solve. So how do you actually know which problems to solve first? Um, and one possibility, one way of doing this is to either let your stakeholders decide which problems to solve or um, to have an ideation session in which you brainstorm about potential problems to solve and pick one of the problems that you've uh, found most promising based on that brainstorm. Um, the thing is here that uh, even though the way that you go about solving that problem that you've picked uh, may be agile, um, the, the problem prioritization process uh, is not. It's actually quite rigid because you pick this one problem and then you stick with it. Um, and um, yeah, we go to show that um, that this might, uh, might not be the most optimal approach for you. So what are some of these downsides? Um, in this approach, um, you focus mostly on the short-term speed versus um, as opposed to the long-term success. So for instance, in the case of having your stakeholders decide um, which problem to solve, maybe your stakeholders, they decide that uh, they want to build a, a sales forecasting model and they have some back of the envelope, a calculation of impact, and it seems quite promising. So you go, go ahead and you start making this model, um, only to find out like two months in or three months in that a, a stock forecasting model may have been way more beneficial to the department uh, with the holiday peak coming up with a lot of packages in the warehouse bringing uh, issues. And then there is the uh, risk of hitting a wall of dependencies and can't do's from other teams. So suppose you picked um, a problem through a brainstorm and um, you decided that you're gonna build a fraud detection model. Uh, you quickly dive into it and you iterate through various versions of this model, um, only to find out that other teams that you need to get this model into production can't help you with that in this period. Um, then you realize that um, had you done uh, a bit of an investigation from the start, you would have realized that maybe if you'd sketched out some alternative uh, problems to solve or ideas, uh, you would have concluded that this may not have been the most ideal thing to do right now. Um, furthermore, you're not exploiting the entire problem space enough to find the high potential projects. And what I mean by this is that if you uh, decide on, on the one problem to focus on for the foreseeable future from the get-go, you um, discount the other things that are, uh, or the other problems that are, uh, that are uh, available in the problem space. Um, and uh, it's often the case that the things that you find in the first ideation session are not all encompassing. So you often run into other things that may be more uh, impactful down the line. So um, it's good to be flexible here and not rigid as in the previous approach. Uh, and lastly, there is a lack of comparisons or benchmarks. So if you only look into one problem and that's all you have, especially when you uh, start in a new department, that might be very well be all that you have. Um, there's nothing to compare it to. There's uh, no comparison of feasibility, dependencies or impact. Um, so this leaves a lot of blind spots there. Um, so that's why we approach the prioritization of problems kind of as an optimization problem in itself. And this sounds uh, quite nerdy uh, and it actually is, but bear with me here. Um, so we uh, kind of see it as something similar to multi-armed bandits. 
And so for those of you who don't know multi-armed bandits yet, the multi-armed bandit problem is a classic reinforcement learning problem, um, which got its name from the world of casinos. So in casinos, you have these uh, slot machines. They are called one-armed bandits. And um, yeah, so the, the thing is that each of these machines has a different payout. And this payout is unknown to you. So you don't know uh, how much money each of these machines will yield. And basically, the idea is that you, you have to figure out which machine has the highest uh, rate of return uh, so that you can maximize your profit, of course. Um, and the crucial trade-off here is that uh, between exploration and exploitation. So suppose um, at the beginning, of course, you don't know anything about these machines. And as you um, start pulling these machines and finding out whether they return something or not, you find out that machine A is doing really well, machine B is doing uh, really poorly, and the rest of the machines you haven't really tried that much yet. So then you can decide either to go with machine A and exploit that one further because you know it's doing quite well, or you can decide to continue to explore the ones that you haven't uh, understood enough about yet. So that's kind of the idea about multi-armed bandits. And that's also how we uh, kind of look at how we want to prioritize our problems. Um, so what do I mean by that? How do we map this algorithm or this, uh, this uh, theory uh, to our um, to our way of working, kind of. So, suppose you have four problems. There could be more, but I was only able to fit four on the slide. Um, uh, you have four problems in your domain, and uh, imagine that each of these problems is, is one of the arms in your multi-arm bandit model. So here uh, you see that, like the uh, multi-arm bandit with its arms. Each of the arms uh, has a payout that you don't know. In this case, it's the underlying business impact that we don't know and that we want to um, start to get uh, to approximate, kind of. So um, as you start out, you don't know anything about each of these problems. So uh, there's nothing to exploit and you start exploring. So for instance, you start exploring idea one. Um, you, uh, after an investigation, you find out that it's a feasible idea, that there are a few dependencies and that it has a high impact. Um, in, a norm, in the previous situation that I sketched, it would, be, um, it would have made sense kind of to, uh, to stop exploring and start exploiting this idea. But we um, kind of want to show that this may not be the most optimal uh, case for us because we don't know anything yet about all the other problems in the space. So we decide to, um, yeah, to document uh, the promise of this idea one and continue exploring the other ideas to get more information. Um, so we continue with idea two, and there you see that it's not a feasible idea and there are many dependencies. So we abort that one. Um, then we continue with idea three, and we see that it's feasible and that there are no dependencies, but the business impact is much lower uh, there. So after you've seen three of these ideas and investigate three of them, you start to grow more and more confident of idea three uh, and less confident about two and three. Um, uh, about idea one, I don't know if I said three. <laughs> um, and uh, here uh, at this point, you could actually say, well, we are quite confident about idea one. Um, and we are so confident that we want to allocate some resources to that idea and start exploiting it. That's totally fair. But you could also decide to continue exploring a bit more and uh, investigate idea four. So there you would say, OK, yes, uh, after investigation, we've seen that it's feasible and that there are no dependencies and that the estimated business impact is double the size of that of idea one. So here you see that. Um, idea four is actually more promising than idea one. Uh, and what I want to uh, show you and what I want you to take away from this is that um, had you stopped at idea one, you would have never come close to finding out about idea four and you would have missed double of that uh, business impact that you could have made. Um, likewise, if you had started out with a brainstorm and, and, and uh, had your eye on idea three, um, you would have maybe uh, accepted a much lower business impact, namely 50,000 instead of the 7 million of idea four. So in this case, this case really clearly illustrates 
the benefit of uh, this continued exploration, uh, all the while maybe already allocating some resources to the promising ideas that you have discovered. Um, so you may wonder, how do they test so many uh, solutions? Uh, don't they just explore for two years or so? How, how is this effective? How can a company um, um, make profit that way? Um, so uh, we don't explore them in, in uh, as a whole. We, we scope these problems down to such an extent that they can be tackled uh, within approximately one or two weeks. So uh, we create these design sprints in which we investigate these problems um, and, um, and evaluate the uh, feasibility, the business impact and dependencies of, the, of these problems um, and, and get answers to those questions that matter the most to us in continuing with the project. So it could very well be that we don't tackle the entire um, uh, technical uh, scope of a problem, but we focus on one uh, one part of it, as long as it's uh, um, kind of generalizable to the other parts, uh, in essence. So um, in this uh, illustration, you see that we pick a problem, maybe through a brainstorm, like in the, in the previous ideas I sketched, um, and then we scope it down, uh, like I described, uh, and then tackle it for about one or two weeks. Um, then after that, we evaluate it, and if there are other results, from other investigations, um, then we compare them. So for instance, in the previous slide, I showed four ideas. Maybe you already did two of them. Then once you've uh, completed the third one, you can compare the results of the third one with the first two. Um, and then you go about um, checking or verifying if the, if the idea was promising, um, was it feasible, were there few or no dependencies, and was the business impact uh, high enough? And was there enough information? So it makes sense to uh, only continue with a, pro uh, a yeah, project if you have enough information about the alternative. So like in the first example, with idea one, we had quite a high business impact, but without knowing about the impact of the other problems, you don't really know um, to what extent is actually high uh, because you don't know what the other ones will yield. So uh, once you know that it's promising and enough, there's enough information, you can start to allocate resources to it. Uh, and otherwise, you go back to picking a problem and you, uh, you do this again until you, do, uh, you are satisfied with your results. Then um, some advantages of this approach. Um, so by having these short cycles of scoped innovation and POCs, uh, we are able to draw conclusions about feasibility and impact uh, really fast. And by having uh, or by testing a wide array of, uh, of problems or solving these problems, we have uh, a lower risk of overlooking the high impact projects because we uh, drill down on various topics within the domain. Um, we are also able to distinguish the small from the large projects as you saw in one of the previous slides. And we uncover problems um, with these uh, ideas early on. So you, you can easily uh, verify if it's a feasible plan or, or not, or if there are dependencies that are blocking your way. Um, furthermore, we're not putting all of our eggs in the same basket. And I think this is really critical because uh, when, once you're starting out in a new domain, um, there are so many things that could still be uncovered or things that are only uh, becoming clear um, a couple of months in. So it's very important to be flexible and to be able to uh, shift your resources wherever you can. And, having all that information about these different alternative uh, routes that you can take will really help you to, to, um, to smoothen that process. Um, so yeah, you may wonder when to uh, stop exploring. Um, so in the initial phase, you really wanna explore as much as you can, uh, explore a different topic in each of these design sprints. And after a while, you will see the clear successes and failures. And then it might make sense to uh, uh, allocate some resources to the successes to start to uh, exploit the, the success. Um, but don't do this too fast because you may risk overlooking some of the other potential success that you haven't explored yet, like we saw with idea one versus idea four. Um, and your best way is to divide your resources once you find a high potential project. So you may, for instance, allocate 20% of your resources to this 
to exploiting this successful project and have the rest of your team explore. And then once you continue with these sprints, also in the exploitation group, uh, after every sprint you evaluate and you see, okay, uh, after two sprints on this exploited project, do we still believe that it has a lot of potential? And then your confidence will grow and grow, or you might spot some drawbacks, which may uh, help you to reconsider putting your resources there and allocating those resources on another successful project or, or to have them um, explore again. So how has this approach helped us? Um, we avoided putting all our resources on small projects with low impact. Uh, so we built this model to reduce the workload of uh, existing processes. But we uh, realized by talking to the users and uh, by the leads of those teams that um, the business impact was actually quite low because the workload um, could easily be covered by the process that were already there. And it didn't make sense to put a lot of uh, data science resources there. Um, so by having these iterations and verifying, uh, refining and improving your ideas, you uh, gather a lot of information about what makes sense and what doesn't. So you don't uh, continue to sit on ideas that are actually low impact. Um, and furthermore, we really explored a lot of uh, different topics and tested many ideas in a short amount of time. So this really helps us to uncover the blind spots of a new uh, domain in, um, in a short period of time. Um, so that was it. I hope you uh, learned something about our, uh, uh, our way of prioritizing problems and hope it helped you to look at the way you prioritize your problems a bit differently. Um, if there are any questions, let me know. Um, so the first question I have for you, uh, Marluz, uh, is from um, Anya. Um, and they're asking, would it be good to know about the process behind how to measure slash evaluate success? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it does help to have clear uh, guidelines for your team, uh, kind of definitions of when something is a success and when it's not. So we, um, we start out with uh, kind of a, uh, from scratch. So we uh, didn't have those systems in place at the beginning, but we're starting to drill down a bit more. And uh, after doing a few of these uh, sprints, you start to get a better understanding of, of which ballpark you're talking about. So what is high impact? At the beginning, you don't know that, but you start to know more and more about which ballpark you're talking about. And talk, or maybe you're talking about uh, profit, maybe you're talking about time saved. So there are different sort of uh, angles to look at this. I, uh, that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. A couple of other questions have come in as well. Um, so me, I would like to know, um, what do you do when a selected project takes longer than expected, as usually happens in practice? Yeah, um, so we have these sprints and they're really scoped. So we have uh, kind of clear deadlines uh, that we test an idea for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, max two actually. Uh, and then if after two weeks, we're still not sure uh, that this is promising, then we decide to park it um, and, and maybe look at it later if there is still some hint of, um, of hope for, for that project. But mostly, uh, if you can't uh, test a scoped idea in two weeks, then we generally say, OK, there might be other things that we need to look at first. Thank you. Mustafa, um, uh, first of all, would like to say thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and the question is, um, do you try to use multiple criteria decision making methods for choosing the best possible project? Um, I'm not really familiar with uh, multi criteria decision making um, uh, ways of working, but we, um, we have like a backlog of problems that we can look into. And we try to get some estimates before we actually pick one. And then after each sprint, we, we sort of narrow down or, or try to get more information about each of these projects. So I, I have to say, I don't really know about this multi um, way of creating these uh, or, or making these decisions. Um, but um, we look at what, what to us makes the most sense in terms of the data that we have. And then we try to get more data to prove that the idea is actually true. Right. 
Um, Jacques would like to know, um, of the dimensions you considered, um, dependencies, feasibility, and impact, are there sometimes strategic projects that business, business want done? Does that simply enter the explore phase, the explore phase slash teams? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I can imagine that in many companies, uh, this is a bit harder than uh, in our case. So we are we actually have quite a lot of freedom to um, to explore and to uh, look into the things that for a data scientist make sense, as opposed to having a stakeholder decide for us. Um, that ha having said that, I think um, it could be that they might push something to be investigated, but they would never really, in our case at least, not they would never really push uh, beyond the investigation uh, uh, side of things. So if we, after two weeks, say, OK, well, this was a great idea, but it's not feasible, then they will accept that. Um, Oren would like to know, um, how do you make sure that learned insights augment and helps in next iterations, rather than being lost and done again and again? Ah, cool. Um, yeah, so we have. Uh, Quite a nice way of documenting our uh, findings. So we have here yeah, we we work with Microsoft Teams. I know it's corny, but um, so we work with the Microsoft stack and, and use OneNote to create these um, documents and, and these um, notebooks of our investigations. And um, yeah, we have some templating in place, but we generally just uh, write down what we find in these sprints and the things that we want to compare uh, after other sprints have taken place. So that way um, we have everything easily available for the future. And then the last question um, from Anya, she would like to know how many people are usually involved in these sprints. Oh, good one. Yeah, so I started out uh, as the only data scientist, but uh, now we've grown to a team of five. So um, yeah, that's really great. And it's quite new still. So we're trying to find a way whether we should divide and conquer or uh, tackle one problem with all of us, but we're more leaning towards having uh, like uh, two or three people working on uh, one sprint. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, Marluz, and thank you everybody as well for your uh, questions. Um, so I'd now like to move on to introduce our second speaker of the day, um, which is Tibert Verhagen. So Tibert is a professor of emerging technology for business at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. His research projects center on innovative technology, store innovation, and information systems. The title of his presentation today is The Rise of Robots in Retail Stores, an Exploration of First Opportunities. Robots are expected to bring change to the future of retail, driven by developments in artificial intelligence, machine learning, speech, and voice technology, and sensory technology. Robots will be increasingly able to perform tasks for the retailer autonomously. This can include managing stock, cleaning the store, welcoming customers, providing entertainment, and delivering purchases at home. Still, many retailers wonder what the possibilities of robots are today. The expert group Robots in Retail of, of Shopping Tomorrow explored the opportunities of robots for physical stores. The results of this exploration are showed and discussed in T-Bird's presentation today. So without further ado, I'd like to give the platform to T-Bird. Great. Uh, yeah, this year I've been one of the uh, of, of the chairman of the expert group Robots in Retail for Shopping Tomorrow, and I thought it would be nice to share um, well the first outcomes with you. Uh, and as already told as well, I'm also part of the expertise center for applied artificial intelligence of our university. Um, so what I'm going to do today, um, I, I'm going to uh, give you a briefing about our first findings of the expert group. Um, and I'd like to consider five uh, facets of that. First, briefly, uh, what is the, the expert group and uh, which members do we have? Then elaborate a little bit upon the rise of ro robots. Then a very uh, crucial question as well, uh, are consumers already ready for robots? So we go, conducted a large scale survey together with uh, uh, GFK, the market research firm, and we'll show you some results. Then, uh, well, one of the, the, the objectives of this, this presentation is also to give you some inspiration. So I'd like to pay attention to uh, a few examples of robots in, uh, in retail practice these days. And I'd like to conclude with uh, a brief discussion about the opportunities uh, of robots uh, for one store today. Um, by the way, I guess it's relevant to mention that um, 
the objectives the objectives that I will show you, uh, the objectives of this expert group, were directly driven by demand in practice. So we also do a lot of academic research, uh, for instance, analyzing uh, uh, robot user interaction data and so on. And we do publish in all kinds of academic journals. But for shopping tomorrow, uh, we clearly got the demand from retailers, especially smaller and medium sized retailers. Okay, robots seem to be coming, but could be in it for us. So from that perspective, this should be seen as a first exploration. Um, the expert group has, a, I think, a pretty clear objective. We'd like to generate first insights about the use of, of robots uh, to optimize two kinds of processes, uh, both sales and operational processes for small to medium sized uh, retail stores. And the previous years, we conducted a lot of research in the field of emerging technology in store environments. And we mainly did so by adopting a sales perspective. So what can you do to apply new technology in physical stores to uh, optimize your selling? But uh, there is a clear demand in practice as well, how you can make use of robots to uh, optimize operational processes. So that's an addition that we, uh, we brought this year. Um, Overall, we know when studying the impact of uh, robotics uh, on retail, uh, you need to, to take a look at it from a couple of perspectives. So we will adopt a customer perspective, but also an employee perspective and an organizational perspective. And those can't be covered at once, and they won't be all covered in this, uh, this presentation, but they will be part of two blue papers that we're going to publish. First paper uh, got published at the end of last month. That is the first well, initial exploration. And a second paper, we hope to get uh, deeper into uh, the implications of robot use uh, for all the uh, stakeholders involved. And after all, uh, arrive at some first pragmatic guidelines for retailers. Uh, what should they do or should they really already start with making use of robotics? Well, just a brief uh, overview of the members of the expert group, just like our uh, expertise center for uh, applied artificial intelligence. It's a very a uh, multidisciplinary team, and that's what I like a lot. Uh, I think when studying these kinds of uh, upcoming forms of technology, you need input from the academic side, you need input from uh, uh, technology uh, companies, from retailers, uh, uh, people representing uh, uh, well the retail sectors in our country. So uh, quite of those have been involved in the group. And uh, well, we studied uh, well the first rise of the robots. So when we talk about the rise of robots, uh, yeah, it, it almost sounds like, like a good story or a good movie. I think it's good to put things into perspective first because uh, well, it's not the first kind of technology that enters uh, store environments. Yeah, what we see is that more and more artificial intelligence applications are being used uh, by retailers. And there are already quite some examples of, uh, in particularly, uh, mechanical and analytical uh, forms of AI. Uh, so what we see is that especially those tasks are greatly be, being taken over by technology. For instance, when you think about Amazon Go, eh, uh, consumers can just enter the store and pick whatever they want and uh, a total of sensors and cameras will track them, see what they put in their baskets and by making use of an app without a lot of effort, they can easily leave the store uh, and then pay for their, for their products. That's a typical example how all kinds of mechanical and also analytical tasks are being taken over. Uh, however, and this is, I guess, quite interesting uh, to all of us, uh, there will be some uh, developments in, in the future uh, focusing more on intuitive and uh, empathetic uh, uh, intelligence. So instead of only um, changing mechanical and analytical tasks, uh, this might imply that we could also uh, get into the feelings of, of, of consumers even, even better and, and give some creative advice and uh, address one need, needs not only from a cognitive point of view, but also by tapping into one's feelings. And we think if there is one form of technology uh, that, that, that could be suited to make use of these kinds of upcoming uh, AI, that, that will be the robot. And what you do see in the picture at the right side of the slide, that, that these days, uh, the, the first robot applications are pretty well capable in, in solving both uh, uh, simple uh, uh, and more complex uh, cognitive analytical tasks. And when you talk about more emotional social tasks, you see that it's 
well, merely a task for the in-store personnel, uh, for, for, for us as, as human beings. Uh, well, there also some, we also see there are some collaborations uh, uh, between humans and robots uh, starting up. But in the future, we can expect that the horizontal dotted line that you see over here will move upwards, which means that robots will be more and more equipped also to take care of emotional social tasks. And yeah, to me, that's a very intriguing development, a little bit futuristic, but I guess that's also what we need to take into account when exploring the, the opportunities of, of these kinds of technology. Um, so then the question is, what is a robot? When we start, started with the expert group, uh, uh, one of the uh, participants immediately said, okay, so we're gonna study uh, um, uh, robotic software, right? Uh, well, that's not really what we want because the overall goal is from this group to serve small and medium-sized retailers who have their physical store. So therefore we adopted this definition uh, that a robot equals an autonomous machine capable of sensing its environment carrying out computation, uh, make decisions and perform actions in the real world. So that, that is basically how we delineate the concept of a robot. And there are a lot of services that robots could provide, industrial, professional service, personal service. Uh, the focus of our group clearly is on professional service robots, uh, carrying out uh, different sales and operational tasks for the retailer. So that's important over here. An important question is, of course, uh, I can be very enthusiastic about uh, all kinds of upcoming AI and the opportunities that it uh, gives robots to perform tasks in the retail environment. But how about the consumers these days? Are they already ready for some robotic technology? Uh, well, to be honest, the, 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 the results are pretty, uh, pretty mixed. Uh, we conducted a survey together with GFK and uh, what you do see is that only uh, well, a limited amount of consumers are already positive. You see over here, for instance, these statements uh, where they are positive towards using robots in retail stores. Well, slightly over 20% is positive about it. When you ask a question regarding uh, the fact that robots could really help people uh, uh, to, to, to being served better, yeah, only 6% 6 agrees. And whether they are more intended to visit the store who has a robot, uh, it's about 8%. Um, what we do see as well, to be honest, is that a very large group of these consumers is pretty neutral in their answering. So that could imply that people just don't know what robots are and what they can do. We are really in the early, early, early stage of an adoption process. So uh, yeah, there, there are still a lot of uh, uh, initiatives uh, uh, to be expected, both from a technology and the retail uh, point of view. Um, but still, this, this puts the things into perspective. When you ask consumers these days, uh, so which kind of tasks do you want uh, robots uh, to fulfill uh, when thinking about a retail store, uh, they, they, there's a mixture of uh, sales and more operational kind of tasks. They, they mentioned cleaning the store, which is pretty obvious because, well, some of those uh, consumers might have a robot at home as well to do some cleaning, uh, but also the filling the shelves, uh, provision of product information, uh, corona prevention, and, and some assistance in terms of the payment and the checkout. Uh, those were, uh, well, the applications mentioned mo most often. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, interesting mixture. By the way, uh, a little bit lower, you see giving personal advice. Um, we are running a, a project with a retailer in Amsterdam where we start programming is so together with the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and TMO Fashion Business School, we will program a robot to give advice. Uh, so that's another uh, exploratory uh, way to, to get some knowledge about the possibilities of robots. So what can robots these days do already in practice? Well, to inspire mainly retailers, we, we gather some examples. Some of those are uh, being found in the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, but most of these examples are, uh, well, from abroad. Um, when you talk about sales processes, um, these three examples uh, yeah, are, are pretty interesting, I guess. Uh, there's a, a robot called Cruiser Robot, and that is, for instance, being used uh, by stores in Belgium. It can really help the customer by, by giving some advice. It does pose some questions, and depending on the answers, 
it can uh, filter out part of the assortment of a store and then make suggestions. Uh, and it can also help with the payments. That's interesting as well, I guess, uh, because it, it gives an option uh, by making use of a QR code to, to, to pay uh, via your uh, mobile phone, via your smartphone, while being in the store. Well, the Pepper robot is another uh, well-known example. Uh, uh, a lot of universities are experimenting with these robots. We have a Pepper robot ourselves as well. And it's being used to welcome customers, uh, to give advice uh, regarding Corona pre prevention. It does some entertainment. Uh, it can also help you uh, regarding uh, some wayfinding when visiting a store. And Pepper robot is, is a well uh, example of that. Uh, quite some stores are experimenting with the pepper in our country. Uh, for instance, the Vote von Zigo store at Utrecht Centraal is a nice example. And also in Amsterdam, they have a store where uh, pepper is, is being tested. Uh, but of course, the sales is not only trying to sell and then uh, let the customer go. It's also about thinking, what should you do after the payment? And uh, when, when talking about uh, helping the customer who, who just bought, Starship Robot is a pretty intriguing example. Uh, it runs, for instance, for a co-op supermarket in the United Kingdom. And what it does do, it delivers uh, the groceries that you bought over there to your home in a circle of, of six kilometers around the store. And it's, it's pretty capable in just moving through, uh, through traffic. Uh, I guess you have a small army of about 20 of these robots. And when it's uh, uh, arrives at your home, you can just open it and make use of an app to confirm that your uh, purchase has been delivered. And then it goes back to the store uh, for the next delivery. So these are expiring examples of robots and sales processes. But there is another side, and that is more the operational side. Uh, these are examples that we found uh, were actually uh, used by retail, uh, in, well, not in the Netherlands, but uh, in the United States and in, in in Russia, for instance. Uh, the Tully robot is a very, uh, uh, well, uh, um, tall uh, a robot. It, it scans the shelves in the supermarket in other stores, making use of RFID uh, tags just to see if all the uh, uh, shelves are still filled and if any replenishment needs to be done. And uh, if needed, it can automatically uh, order the products who are sold out. Uh, so as such, it really helps the service personnel in making sure that all the um, um, shelves are, are filled with the products to be to be sold. A Geek Plus, it's a, well, a, a pretty huge uh, robot. It really helps uh, the in-store personnel also with stock replenishment, but mainly by uh, carrying a lot of heavy things uh, uh, towards, uh, towards the shelves. Uh, I guess it can carry about 1500 kilos and it knows exactly where to go to. And it is being applied by a Decathlon store in, in Russia. And uh, over there, it really helps with the in-store transportation of goods. Um, a more futuristic example is a Furhead robot. It's introduced by, uh, it's related to university work in, uh, in Sweden. And uh, that robot has really helped, uh, it is being used to help uh, uh, with job applications. It can really uh, uh, mimic uh, the talk that you used to have uh, with uh, possible uh, candidates. It poses all kinds of questions and makes use of AI software also to track and, and to determine the soft skills and the personality skills of the candidates. Uh, it's a very close collaboration with the university over there. Um, and it also is being used to avoid the discrimination these days. And just by making use that you really have all the facets of, uh, of a candidate know him uh, or her uh, both uh, uh, from a cognitive point of view as, as well as the soft skills. Uh, and Fuert is also being used and that's another application for training purposes. It can really uh, um, uh, mimic, for instance, a complaining customer. And then uh, the person not to be trained in a retail store, of course, needs to react and all the conversation is being, is being stored. And uh, as such, there are, yeah, there really is a multitude of all kinds of customer uh, sales personal interaction that, that can, be, can be tested and can be trained. Finally, the night scope uh, is a pretty tall robot and it helps uh, retailers and managers of retail areas to, uh, well, to, to keep everything safe, to, uh, uh, to avoid uh, uh, thieves coming in, 
to avoid any uh, unwanted behavior of customers. And it's, it's really stuffed with cameras and it's directly related to a control room and it makes use of AI, uh, AI software and AI applications just to see if anything is going on in the store or uh, uh, where people park their car, just to see if, if something uh, uh, unwanted is, is happening over there. And it has a very uh, huge bu button on top. Uh, so even for whatever reason, one of the customers feels scared or something's going on, there's a robbery, you can just put the button and then the police will arrive right away. And just by tracking everything and making use of this software, it tries uh, to prevent theft and all kinds of unwanted behavior. So these are examples that, that we have found uh, uh, mainly in the United States um, and also in Russia. The, the, another nice thing to, to put forward is that these are examples of um, uh, robots operating in isolation. But what we also found in Australia, there's a nice, uh, nice store. It's an, uh, uh, an ice cream bar uh, called Niska and their robots are working together uh, and they really made use of robotic technology uh, well, to reinvent their business model. So we have uh, three applications over there, a pepper robot, Eka robot and a Tony robot. And the pepper robot, well, he takes the order and explains the entire process. Then uh, uh, Eka uh, starts to work. Uh, uh, Eka scoops the, all the ice that you really want and he hands it over to Tony. And Tony puts all kinds of toppings on top of your ice cream and hands it over uh, to the customer who's waiting at, uh, for, for the ice to be to, to being delivered. Um, and it really received a lot of uh, PR that's interesting, but they also are trying to make use of the technology to uh, reinvent their, their ice cream business. So I, I guess it's just, uh, there could be a lot of other examples, but it just tells you, learns you that it's not only about one robot being put in a store, but we should also start thinking about collaboration, human-robot collaboration, but also robot-robot collaboration. Finally, um, when bringing things together, uh, we found quite some examples and th 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 there is more information about the, uh, the robots that I just showed you in, in the blue paper. But still the, the question for the retailer is, okay, should I start with robots right now? What are the opportunities? And we try to look at it in a very objective way. Uh, there are four facets that should be taken into account. The availability, the functionality, the cost and the revenues, but also the, the customer attitude. Uh, regarding the availability, I just showed you the pepper robot and the cruiser robot. When talking about sales processes in, in, in Netherlands and Belgium, those are these days the, the robots uh, that are available. There, there are a lot of other examples uh, abroad and a lot uh, of, of other robots will uh, enter our market, but still the availability is rather limited these days. Another important thing is the functionality because still some people have the thought, okay, I'm gonna use a robot. I'm just gonna throw it into the store and it's gonna work right away. It's like a Siri or an Alexa and I can talk to it and that's gonna happen. But this is, this is really not how robots work these days. It, it, it's, it's more about being very precise about the task that you want the robots uh, uh, to perform. They don't uh, have a lot of flexibility. So you should be really in control and assign a particular task to the robot and make sure that the, the thing that the robot can do, the conversation that it does have, for instance, uh, do fit with the, the intended tasks. Cost and revenues, uh, yeah, the, uh, it makes sense that robots, uh, we're in the beginning of the adoption curve, are uh, relatively expensive. Uh, robots, Pepper costs about 17, 18,000 euros. Cruiser, Cruiser is, if I'm right, uh, close to 30,000. And especially when you talk about small and medium sized retailers, that's really a lot of money. So should you uh, put your money into a robot to do something else? Um, and, and next to uh, uh, the price that you, you need to pay for, for getting it, there are also some service costs. But on the other hand, the expert within the group, they pointed at a lot of possible revenues. Yeah, so we're talking about cost reduction, uh, satisfied customers, you're able to attract some new customers, you're able to re reinvent, yeah, you could be able to reinvent your business model. Uh, PR, because this technology is pretty new, uh, it's really gonna generate a lot of buzz. Um, so it's going to be up to the retailer to think through uh, 
uh, the cost versus uh, the revenue, uh, yeah, the outcomes uh, uh, ratio to see if this is really interesting for him or her. Finally, the customer attitude. Well, I, I just showed you some examples of the GFK uh, results. Most consumers are pretty skeptical or neutral these days. Of course, unknown makes unloved, uh, but this is something that uh, retailers must take into account when considering adopting a robot. And I can also tell you, and it's not part of the presentation, that there are some demographic differences. For instance, men are more into making use of robots than women. And also uh, uh, consumers from a younger age group are more willing to make use of robots than a moral, moral uh, age group. Uh, so depending on your target market and the things that you, you sell as a store, uh, yeah, always keep your eye on what your specific target group wants uh, because it could lead to the adoption use of robots or not. And that's of course very crucial when thinking about making use of this technology. Okay, this was my presentation. Uh, Anita, I guess I will uh, kind of give it up to you right now. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Siebert. That was a very informative presentation. Um, we've already had one question um, come in, um, and that is from Thomas. And he would like to know, how do you ensure that the algorithm itself used by Four Hats does not discriminate? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I guess that really demands for some clear validation and, and, and uh, a tryouts in practice uh, by making use of a very diverse group of uh, uh, possible candidates to see if it works. I, I think one of the uh, reasons of existence for, for this company, and especially for the company providing the algorithm, is that it does work. So I can't imagine that there will be any discrimination in it, because if a couple of customers start using it, and they have their doubts, then the company, uh, well, most likely will be gone. But this absolutely is something that, that needs for cross-validation, uh, just to see how it, how it works out. I'm not part of the development team over there, that's for sure. So I can't give you any answer regarding uh, characteristics uh, of this algorithm. But uh, yeah, my suggestion would be to put it to practice and have all kinds of uh, parties use it to see if it's really uh, going for the inclusive society. Thank you for that. Um, Jasper would like to know um, what kind of added value brings a robot um, slash face recognition slash data science to NLP, NLP, profiling of clients, customers, employees? Is there a timeline of next processes? Wait, sorry, let me say that again. Is there a timeline of next processes can take over by robots? Um, yeah, we're still working on, on such a timeline. Right now, we do see that the, the more easy tasks are being uh, taken over. Uh, by the way, a lot of people uh, are, are starting to, to get a little bit scared that robots will take, take over the complete jobs of people. Maybe so for some, some part, repetitive tasks, that could be the case. Uh, but what you're going to see is that the more this technology evolves and, and, and develops, the more a complex task can be uh, taken over. Uh, but, but it would affect me a very good idea. So thank you for the suggestion to start up a timeline to see uh, uh, over time the developments of robotics and the kind of tasks that they are able to fulfill within the retail context. Thanks for that. Uh, Dave would like to know, do you think adoption of robots will acceler accelerate due to the current crisis? Uh, yeah, yeah, we are working with uh, some robotics uh, companies and uh, the fact that uh, it's pretty tricky uh, to have a lot of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, conversations with personal uh, due, due to the, the COVID crisis might, might speed things up. Uh, I, I think it's part of a, of a more broader de development that you see that uh, uh, retail stores already were under pressure, right, by, by the, the online competition and developments and they already had to rethink their, their future and the, the crucial role of technology in it. And I guess right now they experience even further that, that there's a very relevant role for uh, technology within their firm and robotics will be part of that. That's for sure. Yeah, but still there will be people reluctant regarding the use of robots, but it's gonna be a matter of time, whether uh, we want it or not, it's gonna be there. And we just need to study how it goes in such a way that it suits uh, all stakeholders uh, uh, engaged. 
Thank you. And this will be the last question from Jack. Um, and Jack wants to know, um, do you think automated stock management systems will come before customer facing robots? Uh, well, when you look at the retail practice, it's much more easy uh, to convince retailers that uh, robots uh, uh, who, who add operational efficiency uh, should be implemented to a store than adding robots uh, servicing customers. Because uh, the, the KPIs, the key performance indicators of more operational robots are much more easy and it makes much more sense for a lot of retailers to invest in that because you can directly uh, compute the outcomes of making use of a robot. And when, when talking about robots facing the customer, it's also more about their image, the branding, their satisfaction, uh, repeat intentions, etc. So I think we're really going to see, just like in the entire supply chain, uh, a, a pretty clear growth of uh, robots um, who serve operational tasks. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Okay, I'd like to just give a big thank you to um, both Tibert and Marlouz for your very informative uh, presentations and for being here today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the webinar, now that we're coming to an end, um, we are partnering with uh, the Half AS Expertise Centrum for Applied Artificial Intelligence to bring you a two part webinar series where we explore everything um, applied AI. So, the second part of this webinar series will be happening next week, um, Wednesday, on the 18th of November at 12, where we'll be exploring um, fintech. Um, so, I'd love to see you all there. Um, hey, I just want to thank the presenters again um, for this really great presentation. Um, yes, and that's it for us today. Bye-bye.